Good morning, church. Good to see you this morning. Beautiful looking crowd, beautiful faces. Man, what a spirit of worship this morning. So good. I, we could have, I didn't even need to preach today. We could have just done a few more songs of worship, and I think I would have been filled up and ready to go. Ready to go. So turn to your neighbor this morning and say, you're an extravagant worshiper. That's good. That's good. Well, I'm excited, man. I'm excited what's happening in our youth ministry, and those are, man, great things. There's nothing better from, a, from an old school youth pastor's heart. There's nothing better than seeing teenagers find Jesus and uh, making a life change then. Uh, if you make the life change when you're a teenager, it saves you from a lot of heartache uh, as you go through life. So just so thankful for Matt and the ministry and uh, those students who gave their hearts to the Lord. Well, we're in a series uh, this month called Divine Direction. How many of you need a little divine direction in your life at times, right? Come on. That's right. Divine Direction. And uh, this week, the title is Wisdom to Discern. Wisdom to Discern. Some of, you, some of the most common questions that I get as a pastor is, man, how do I know God's will for my life? How do I know what his direction is? What does he want me to do? So we're digging into those questions over the, over the course of this series. And one of our key thoughts for this series is the decisions that we make today determine the stories that we will tell tomorrow, right? In other words, we make our decisions and our decisions make us. And that's what this series is about. This series is a very practical series simply talking about decision making because over the course of 2018, if you think about this upcoming year, there are going to be hundreds and thousands and millions collectively decisions that we will make, that you will make. You're going to have daily decisions. You're going to have weekly decisions. You're going to have big decisions. You're going to have small decisions. You're going to have life-altering decisions. All these decisions that you're making, well, how do we make the right decision? How do we know what the right decision is? How do we move in a direction that God is leading us? And how do we make those decisions with divine direction? So that's why we're talking about this because, man, this, this hits all of us right where we're at. And we need wisdom in order to make those decisions. So last week we talked about two ideas. The first idea that we talked about is that God is more concerned with who are you becoming who are you becoming than what you do, your vocation, your job, any of that? He's more concerned about who you are becoming. So it was who before you. do. Gosh, you guys were listening. Come on. Gets me fired up. Right, who before do. The second one was God is more concerned with the why before the what. Right, God is more concerned with the why you're doing something than specifically what you're doing. Decisions are so incredibly important because, we have, as we have said, the decisions that we make today are going to determine the stories that we tell tomorrow. And last week, we introduced this idea that many people today are having a more difficult time making decisions than they did in the past. And this doesn't affect just the emerging generation. I think this affects all of us. But there are a lot of articles that have been written explaining that the emerging generation is finding it more difficult to make decisions and they battle with indecisiveness more than previous generations before them. So in working with teenagers and young adults for the last 18 years, I think that this is probably true. But I think it's true for all of us to some extent. So I'm kind of digging into this and we talked last week about one of the reasons and that is that there's just too many options today. There are so many options for us to choose from. And it used to be we only had a couple options and made the choice a whole lot easier. But now, man, now we've been Netflixed. Our whole culture has been Netflixed. We have everything that we want at the push of a button. We have all kinds. We have a, we have a plethora. There's a good word, right? A plethora of choices in front of us. A smorgasbord to choose from. We have all these different all these different choices. Today, it seems like we, got, we have unlimited options. So I was trying to get a new phone case the other day, and I was in Target, and Target's got this whole aisle 
full of phone cases, and I was standing there with what seemed like forever. I think it was about 30 minutes, and I'm trying to decide which one of these phone cases I want to buy, and I was getting frustrated because I'm like, I'm wasting my time here. And finally, I was about to just leave. Finally, I came to my senses. I said, wait, this just has to protect my phone for when I drop it or my kids drop it. That's all it's got to do. So I looked at the aisle, I grabbed one, and I walked out. Well, I mean, I paid for it first. <laughs> I paid for it first, and then I, then I walked out. I just made a decision and went. But it was crazy how indecisive I was, and, and I'm usually a very decisive person. So I got it, and I left. But there are many, there are many options today, so many options Today, you can travel places you couldn't afford to travel before. You can see things that you've never seen. Instead of choosing between a few restaurants, you can have just about anything you want delivered to your home with the right phone app. And because there are so many options, it makes making decisions difficult. A second reason that I think is important for us to realize is that this is the first generation that's dealt with, pe with what people call the illusion of perfection, right? It's a common problem. For example, man, when I grew up, I knew all about my imperfect home. I knew all about my imperfect friends and, and their imperfect families. I mean, I got a front row seat to the imperfections. Today, because of social media, we see what many call the illusion of perfection. You see a snapshot into the lives of other people that look what? Perfect. That's right. They look perfect on social media, right? In fact, many times we call social media the highlight reel of a person's life. And what happens is we compare people's highlight reels to our behind the scenes life and we conclude that, man, our lives are horrible compared to these perfect lives on social media. Man, we are losers, <laughs> right? And you know how that is. I mean, there she is again with that perfect body, working out in that perfect pose. There he is again in that, in that what seems like that perfect relationship. There they are on the perfect date. There they are again with that perfect meal with their perfect kids and their perfect family. <laughs> right? And, and, and we start comparing and, and you compare all the imperfection you see with, with your Pinterest fail. And you think, oh man, I stink. I'm just an absolute loser. What is my problem? So there's all this comparison happening, and then there's this, there's this perfect picture out there that in reality is unattainable. And then, and then the followers of Jesus step in, and they add something known as the perfect will of God. And so many people believe that there must be one perfect person for everybody, my soulmate. You ever heard somebody say, I found my soulmate? Yeah, they're clueless. <laughs> it's kind of a funny thing because, man, if just one person marries the wrong person, the whole system's messed up. <laughs> it's blown. We're all going to marry the wrong person then. But I, I don't want to miss this, this perfect will of God. And, and because there's this illusion of perfection out there, there's a whole generation afraid of making imperfect decisions. So instead of making imperfect decisions, they end up making no decision, which ends up actually being quite dangerous. This morning I wanna talk about how, how do we grow in our decision-making process? How do we grow in making decisions? How do we grow in an environment where it's become difficult to decide. I mean, where do I go to college? Should I date this person or shouldn't I? Should, should I get married? Should, should we have another kid? Should we buy this house or should we just rent? Should we get another car? Should I take this job? Should we move to another city for $12,000 more a year? I mean, how, how do we know what God wants us to do? The good news is, if you're a follower of Jesus, God will show you exactly what he wants you to do. There will be no doubt in your mind. You will be 100% sure there will never, ever be any problems or obstacles at all. And every decision you make will be smooth sailing. And everything I just told you is false. It's a lie. It's untrue. But this is what so many people think. 
So I want to show you a portion of scripture this morning that to me is very, very fascinating. This is the Apostle Paul writing. And, and if you think about the Apostle Paul and his life and what you read about him in scripture, I'm thinking to myself, man, if anybody, if anybody is going to understand what God wants, it's got to be a, the Apostle Paul, right? If anybody's going to understand this, right? So because this dude wrote, he, he wrote most of the New Testament. He had encounters with God in heavenly places. He started churches all over. And if anybody knows what's coming and God's going to give someone insight, it's got to be the Apostle Paul. Watch how detailed Paul's understanding of what is coming in the future is. Let's read this together. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 6 through 9. Perhaps I will stay with you for a while or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective work has opened for me and there are many who oppose me. It's not smooth sailing for Paul. And when you read this, when you read that passage of scripture, we quickly see that Paul didn't have a clue what was coming. He had as many questions as we do, if not more. He didn't understand the details, and yet he served God in a very effective manner. And if you feel a little bit like Paul, take comfort in this passage. God doesn't always show us the future. God doesn't show us all the details. If he did, where would our faith come in? Right? Where would being dependent on him day after day come in? Proverbs chapter 16 verse 9 says, Man makes plans in his heart, but the Lord determines his steps. How do we grow into God's perfect will? Step by step. I want to talk about wisdom to decide and wisdom to discern. See, wisdom is one of the most important traits you can pursue, one of the most important things you can pursue from your heavenly father. Wisdom is something that I pray for on a regular basis, and it's something that you should pray for on a regular basis as well. In fact, wisdom is what Solomon asked for in the Old Testament. Right, and there's a quick lesson, lesson if you're newer to the church or you're newer to scripture or you're newer to the faith. This comes out of 2 Chronicles. It's in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles chapter 1. And when Solomon became king, he was to sacrifice a bull before the Lord to make a burnt offering. That was the requirement. Sacrifice a bull before the Lord for a burnt offering. And Solomon wanted to worship God with such extravagance that instead of making one sacrifice, he made a thousand sacrifices, 1,000 bulls, 1,000 burnt offerings. This was an extravagant act of worship toward God. And that night, God came to Solomon in a dream, and God said to him, hey, Solomon, ask me for whatever you want. I will give it to you. Don't ever think for a moment that generosity doesn't move the heart of God. It does. An extravagant move of generosity draws the heart of God. God says, man, I'll give you anything you want. And Solomon doesn't ask or say, give me riches, give me more power, or destroy my enemies. But he says, okay, Lord, help me be a good king. Give me the wisdom to know right from wrong. Give me wisdom to make the decisions that will honor you. Solomon asked for wisdom. And God said, okay, because you didn't ask for all these other things, I'm going to give them to you as well. And I'm going to give you what you asked for. I'm going to give you great wisdom. This is why Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, Don't turn your back on wisdom, for she will protect you. Love her, and she will guard you. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do, and whatever you do, develop good judgment. If you prize wisdom, she will make you great. Embrace her, and she will honor you. You see, at some point in our lives, we all come to the realization, and we've all said this before, 
man, I wish I knew back then what I know now. We've all said that before, haven't we? What is that? That's wisdom. Solomon said, man, I, 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 I want wisdom. I want wisdom above everything else. Well, wisdom, wisdom is more, God said wisdom is more valuable than gold. Get wisdom. God, I want divine direction. Show me what to do. Listen, God was not always going to show you what to do, but he will give you the wisdom to decide. Ask for wisdom. Many times when I've asked God to show me what to do in a decision that I was making, he didn't come right out and give me the answer. Instead, as I prayerfully read through his word, he, he would highlight and he would give me promises that pointed me in a direction. This is what took place in 2003. I was a youth pastor down in Grove City, Ohio, and at the time, Grove City was like, uh, had like 3,500 people in it. it was, the church was booming. It was going great. I was one of the youth pastors there. I had a great mentor over me. Uh, uh, Holly and I, we just bought a house a year before that. I mean, everything was going well. We had great people around our lives. We had friends. I mean, things were going really well. And because we were at a large church, uh, uh, we would get requests all the time. There was job offers all the time just coming across. And, and you know, I'd always just shove those aside. No, I don't want to go anywhere. I don't want to go anywhere. I don't want to be a youth pastor there. I don't want to be youth. You know, just, I wouldn't even give them the time of day. And then all of a sudden, in 2003, the opportunity to come to the Woods Church came across my desk. And something was different. Something got really excited inside. Something began to leap in my heart, and I was like, God, why would I want to go anywhere? I mean, this is great. Everything's going good here. I don't want to go anywhere. And I began to fast and pray, and I actually went into town, into the city, and I, I went to a Barnes and Nobles, and I found a chair in the corner of a Barnes and Nobles, and I sat there for about four hours, and I began to read God's word, and I began to pray. And out of John chapter 15, I got to John chapter 15 as I was just reading through some scripture and through his word, and God gave me four promises out of John chapter 15. And those promises were promises like, I am with you. Wherever you go, I am with you. And all these promises that he gave me out of there, I, would look at, I looked at all, all four of those promises, and they all pointed, they all had, had a theme. They all pointed in a direction. And I heard God, I prayed, and I heard God tell me very specifically. He said, John, I'm gonna bless you if you stay, and I'm going to bless you if you go. It's your decision. You're doing what I've called you to do, but I've also given you choices. You can choose, and he gave me that decision, but when I looked at those promises that he was giving me to his word, they all pointed in a divine direction to something new, to a new start, so what happened was I made the decision and I left God's country, Buckeye land, <laughs> and I moved to Wolverine land. <laughs> it's the best decision I ever made. I look back, I look back on all those years from 2003, I look back at what God has allowed me to be a part of. Incredible growth, incredible youth ministry, the, the things that I've been able to take students on to do and to see and the, the conferences and the missions trips and, and just how God's guide, guided and directed my life. I look back at his faithfulness and his promises. Man, I've lived one of the most exciting lives that I know that anybody could live. I mean, it's exciting. It's fun. I think, I think of those guys that make quadruple the amount of money that I make who travel uh, or do that and they're, 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 at a, they're at a job and they're traveling or, or whatever the case is. But I think of those guys like, uh-uh. I wouldn't give this up for that. No, I have seen God at work. I have seen God's faithfulness. I have seen God move. I have seen life transformation and life change. It was all one decision that was made up of a lot of smaller decisions to say, God, I'll go wherever you go. God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. God, I surrender my life to you. God, I offer myself to you as a living sacrifice daily. All those little decisions led up to a big decision that changed the course of my life. And that was to hear. Decisions matter. Choices matter. So I'm going to give you three real simple thoughts that should be easy for you to remember that will help take you on God's divine 
direction via wisdom. The first thing is this. <clears throat> Number one, if you're taking notes, walk with the wise. Walk with the wise. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20 says, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. How many of you have tried to tell your kids this before? Right? I love this. This is so simple. Walk with the wise and say it with me. Become wise. When you walk with the wise, you become wise. But if you run with the wrong people, bad things tend to happen. Countless times I've had conversations over the years with teenagers and, and adults alike who have recently accepted Christ into their lives, but man, they're still struggling. They're still struggling with some of the old patterns, some of the old patterns of sin. And, and I will ask them, well, well, who do you hang out with? Who, who are your friends? And are any of your friends that you normally hang out with or live life together with, are, 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 you, are, are, they, are they Christians? Are they are they? passionately following Jesus? Are they, are they being a reflection of Christ to you? And, and they're like, no, none of them. And I'll be like, well, here's one of your problems. You're running with the wrong people. Associate with fools and you will get in trouble. Listen, your mom was right when she said, show me your friends and I will show you your future. I don't care if you're 16, if you're 46 or 76, the wisdom here is pretty solid. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and you'll find yourself in trouble. And I love this imagery that we're told to walk with the wise. In other words, do life with the wise. This isn't, hey, go ask a wise person for advice. No, we're actually plugged in. We're doing life together. We're walking with those who are like-hearted, like-minded, and following Christ passionately. And this is one of the reasons why we encourage you so much to, to get out of your rows and get into circles. We encourage you and we want you to be a part of a small group or a men's group or a women's group or a group for teenagers and element groups or, or classes. Uh, you know, what we all need is other strong believers around us who are consistently in our lives on a daily and weekly basis who are helping us in the choices we make and the decisions we make to go in a divine direction. Not our own direction, but a divine direction. Because going to church for one hour a week and doing a little daily reading plan is not enough to overcome the pull of this world towards the things that are displeasing to God. When you're in a daily work environment that's filled with so much worldliness and so much sinfulness, you need to walk with people consistently who will speak life and truth into you and help you step in the right direction. This is why we are so passionate about all of our people here at the Woods Church and all of our campuses connecting with a group or connecting with a class because we want you to gain wisdom. We want you to take steps in your life with divine direction. And in order to do that, we've got to have wisdom. We've got to surround ourselves with wisdom. Parents, if your teenagers are not involved in an element group, I would, I would say to you that discipleship is one of the strongest things that occur in our element groups. We have handpicked, chosen, and developed leaders who will pour into your students and help them walk with wisdom and make wise choices. Listen, your students will never plug in by only bringing them once or twice a month. And again, who do you want your teenagers spending the majority of their time with? Walking with the wise or associating with fools? See, I hear story after story of young people who say that, man, their small group leader made all the difference in their lives during those middle school or those high school years. I mean, my kids in just a couple years, they're going to be teenagers. And you better believe, man, I am watching them like a hawk. I am watching who they want to hang out with, who they're playing video games with, who they, who, you know, who, what friends they want to have over to the house. Man, I'm watching you know, when I first started in youth ministry 19 years ago this month, I knew I needed some wise people in my life because I was dumb. <laughs> I didn't have a clue, you know, what I was doing. The only people I had in my life were other college age kids, which, which, which are good. You got to have brothers in your life. But man, I needed people in my life who, who had gone before me, people with wisdom who would, who would lead me and guide me and direct me. And I, needed a, I needed a Rob Paul who not only taught me youth ministry, who's a mentor of mine, who was our lead youth pastor when I started there at Grove City, but, but, but taught me wisdom in my life and how to step wisely. 
Rob pastors, uh, pastors Shepherd Church of the Nazarene down in Columbus, Ohio. And I still consider him a mentor and a friend. And when I need wise counsel, I still call him. I knew I needed to be around spiritually sensitive people who were experiencing God on a whole nother level that, that I hadn't experienced them yet that I wanted to go to. And I wanted to get to another level. That's why I've got people like Chad Klein in my life who's coming to speak at our men's conference here in February. In fact, he just spoke yesterday at the call in Nationwide Arena down in Columbus, Ohio. I mean, he's awesome. I mean, his giftings of discernment and his giftings of the prophetic are supernatural to say the least. And man, I just, I got to have Chad's in my life. He's a pastor as well down in Grove City. I needed to surround myself with a wise pastor. And this happened just this past summer. I needed to surround myself with a wise pastor who was leading a church larger than ours so that I could glean wisdom from him, so that I could surround myself uh, with with greater wisdom and how to lead a large church. And so I connected with with Lee Cummings, who's pastor of RadiantChurch.tv over in Kalamazoo. And his church runs over 3,000 people. He's got a couple campuses. And he's established a radiant network of like 12 churches around the country. Man, I want to be around dreamers. I want to be around people who can help me and help us on the journey. Wisdom is one of the greatest reasons that I love the church board here at the Woods Church. I know that when we're facing any decision, that our church board is going to start on their knees, asking God and praying for the wisdom, for his wisdom to make the decisions that impact the direction and and the places that we go. And then I know that they'll use wisdom and the knowledge that God has given them to make the best possible decision for our church and for our people. I have witnessed this for over a decade from them. Time and time again, I have the utmost faith in them. In fact, when I took the lead position here, Man, I, I said, man, I gotta, I gotta have some wisdom around me. And what I did is I took four of those board members and I made this little executive team because I needed people around me to help give me wisdom in some of the weekly and daily and big decisions that, that we had to make as a church and as a st- church staff. So I gathered them and surrounded them just to run things by them, just to glean from their wisdom and from their experience. See, I tell you all of this just to give you a picture of what it looks like to surround yourself with wisdom. Church, if it was just me, I would crash and burn and fall and fail all the time. But I've surrounded myself with such wisdom, wisdom in our staff, wisdom in our born, uh, board, wisdom from people in my life, that I'm not, I don't fear failing. I don't fear crashing and burning. I got a lot of great people and a lot of wisdom in my life. And you need that wisdom too. You've got to surround yourself with wisdom. So number one was this, if you want divine direction, walk with the wise. Number two, if you want divine direction, ask God for wisdom. When you ask God, he loves to share wisdom with his children. So ask him. And here's the deal though, man. If you're going to ask him for wisdom and in order to glean that wisdom, you've got to spend time with him. And I promise you, man, you can, get, you can get wisdom for your life every single day from his word. You can, you can get it every single day from other believers that you've surrounded yourself with. You can get it every day by hearing the voice uh, of his Holy Spirit. I mean, he's a good shepherd who guides the sheep. And I, and I love this. As he guides and leads, that means our job is to what? If he's guiding and leading, what's our job? To follow. When we walk with him, he leads us to where he wants us to go. You have to spend time with him though. And when you do, he will give you wisdom. Psalms chapter 32, verse eight, the Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. Who wants the best pathway? Man, I'm not satisfied with just a good pathway. And if I choose the path myself, it's gonna be a bad pathway. I want the best pathway for my life. So in order to get the best pathway for my life, I have to go to God. I have to go to God for his wisdom because he says, I'm going to guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and I will watch over you. I will guide you, I will advise you, and I'll watch over you. God, please just tell me what to do. He may not tell you exactly what to do, but he'll give you the wisdom to decide. 
He will guide you, he will advise you, and he will watch over you. As you read that verse, doesn't it just remind you of parenthood? I feel like it reminds me of parenthood. I will guide you, I will advise you, and I will watch over you. I think about teaching my boys to swim, and we taught Hudson and Max to swim at like three and four years old, somewhere right in there. And I remember being in the big pool and, and just my hand underneath their belly as they're trying to swim. And I'm trying to get them, I'm telling them the instructions of swimming. You gotta move your arms and you gotta kick your feet and you gotta do it at the same time and don't swallow water. <laughs> Swallowing the water is bad. Right? So I remember beginning, you know, I would say, all right, move your arms. And they'd be moving their arms, but their feet are just like silent through the water. You know, I'd be like, okay, now you got to kick your feet. And all of a sudden they start focusing on their feet and their arms go down to, they're like, they look like seals kind of going through the water, you know. They're they're not moving their arms. So the, the big trick was getting them to move their arms and their feet at the same time and not suck in water. You know, and, and I would tell them as we're going along, and don't worry, if you go under, I'm right here. I'm right here. I'll watch over you. I'll pull you right up. You know, and now my boys are like eight and 10, and now they're great swimmers, and we go to Florida on vacation or something, and we're at the beach. I mean, they're 30 yards out and eight foot of water, diving down with snorkel masks on the bottom and finding shells and finding all kinds of things and seeing fish and seeing stingrays and doing whatever they're doing out there. And if I'm not out there doing it with them, which most of the time I am because I love doing that stuff, I'd be on the beach and I'm just watching them. I'm watching them go up and down. You know, 20, 30 seconds later, here they pop up again, and here they're going back down. And I'm just, I'm watching over them, making sure that when they go down, they pop back up. You know, that's what I'm doing. It's it's what God does. I will guide you, I will advise you, and I will watch over you. Lastly is this. It's very simple. Decide. Make a decision. Walk with the wise. Ask God for wisdom and then decide. Make a decision. See, growing up, I loved the original Karate Kid movie. You know, the new one's really cool, too. I, I love uh, Jackie Chan. He's funny. It's got some great lines in it, but the old one's got some really good lines in it. The old one's got some good lines. In the first movie, Mr. Miyagi says something like this. He says, Daniel's son, must talk. Walk on road, walk on right side, safe. Walk on left side, Safe. Walk middle. Sooner or later, get squished like a grape. (laughs) That's good wisdom. Right there. And some of you, you may not be old enough to remember that classic line, but man, that's really good advice. And what I want to say to all of us this morning is, don't be so afraid of making a mistake when you choose. The biggest mistake may not be just walking down the middle. The biggest mistake will most likely be not making a decision at all. So here's the question. Well, how do I know if if this is God? Is this an open door from God? Should I walk through this open door? Is this just coincidence? Is this the enemy in some kind of twisted way trying to trip me up? And listen, if Scripture doesn't give you clear direction... In other words, there are things that God, God's word says to do, and there are things that God's word says not to do. There are obviously sin issues, issues of sin and issues of righteousness that are undeniable, that's plain, it's black and white, don't do this, do this, all right? It's, it's part of God's word. But in those situations, whenever God's word speaks, our response is to follow. There are things that God's word will say to do or not to do, but not always. There's going to be decisions you'll make. Do I move across the country? Well, God's word doesn't tell me to move or not to move. It's a decision you have to make. God could have programmed you to do exactly what he wanted you to do, right? But then you wouldn't have had the freedom to choose to love him back. And he loved you enough to give you the freedom to make your own choice. So you can experience real love and so that you can choose him. So don't freak out. God says, you decide. I trust you. Make the call. Well, what if I make a mistake? Make the call. 
I'm going to tell you right now, as a pastor, there are times when God speaks to me, there are times that I know that I know that I know what he wants me to do, what direction he wants me to walk, what direction he wants me to take the church, what he wants us to start. What, there are times that I just know, I know he's spoken to me very, very clearly. But there are many more times where God says, John, I trust you. Make the decision and move forward. But what if I make a mistake? Guess what? When you make a mistake, what do you get? Wisdom. You get wisdom. You probably won't make that mistake twice. And if you do, <laughs> we have other issues. <laughs> you get wisdom. I mean, you may get an extra bill in the mail, like my story last week of getting my ticket in Texas. I should have took the interstate, right? You may get an extra bill in the mail. You may have to take an extra semester in school. You may have to swallow a piece of humble pie. But you also get wisdom. God will guide you. God will advise you. God will watch over you as he gives you wisdom to decide. Would you pray with me this morning? Dearly Father, I'm so thankful for your faithfulness to us. I'm so thankful for the promises that we even read this morning that you would guide us and advise us and watch over us. God, I think about our church and our families and our people, God, who in 2018 will make so many choices. They will make so many decisions. Some of them are going to be small decisions. Some of them are going to be big decisions. Some of them are going to be life-altering decisions. My prayer is that, God, you would help us all to make decisions that would take us in a divine direction, that would help us honor you and glorify you, that we would make the decisions that would be a reflection of you, whether those are simple daily choices or whether those are life-altering choices. God, we want to glorify you and bring glory to your name. So God, I just pray for a spirit of wisdom across our families and our churches as they prepare, as they plan, as they choose, as they decide, as they, as they uh, confront some of these challenges, as they confront some of the choices that are going to be right in front of them. Give us wisdom, God. Give us your wisdom. May we seek the wisdom of wise, godly people that we've surrounded ourselves with. And God, I pray that you will always be faithful, and I know you will, to point us in a divine direction. We love you, and we praise you. And God's people said, amen. amen. As always, if you're brand new with us this morning, we would love for you to stop by Guest Central right out here in our lobby. Also, maybe you're in the process right now of making a decision. We have a wonderful prayer team, and prayer team members will be up here at the front at the end of the service, and you may just want them to pray over you for the decision you're making. Please feel free to come forward and do that. As you go today... May you go with the wisdom of God and make a decision. Have a great day.